Do you have any bad experiences with directors that you want to name? Yes. <laughs> like, that you don't have to name. You would have gone insane. So you're making messed up looking stuff. Okay, that's pretty good. Studio should do it. Would you say that you've experienced life? <laughs> <laughs> this is the part that makes me go crazy. How did this get done? This was so chaotic. Welcome to the friggin' Project City Podcast. And here we go. <laughs> All right. I, I think we could start with... Um, how we each got into the animation industry could be interesting. Um, Katrin, you want to start? We yeah. can start with you. Yeah. Um, so my name's Katrin, and uh, I'm a storyboard artist, revisionist, and um, ooh, like how I got started in the industry was, uh, I mean, I guess I interned first. That was like the first thing that happened for me, which was really lucky because um, it was a different time, uh, <laughs> like uh, 2009. Um, back then, if you were a student in the LA area, pretty much Cartoon Network would take anybody with good grades. So uh, I got into that internship program. And then the year after, um, I think like a law changed or something and they made it so that they had to pay interns. So they went from having like 10 interns on a show to having one intern on a show. Do you feel like that was good or bad? Uh, I think it was, mm, I think it was good because I, I feel like the internship program before was it was kind of just hangout time, which I guess is good for networking, but um, there was just, like, people just, like, students just around yeah. a lot. Um, some of them did do stuff and helped out, but a lot of the times you were just kind of, like, chilling. And so they, uh, when the second semester came around and I was being paid, and it was, like, minimum wage, so it basically paid for my gas, um, I uh, actually got, like, hands-on production experience. Um, so which, it was a better internship. Yeah, so I had a, okay. I actually had a much better experience my second time around. I had a great time like meeting people and making friends, and those friends ended up turning into colleagues later because that was because um, I graduated and wasn't really like ready to like jump in as an artist. I like was lacking in a lot of skills, so I went to like CDA brainstorm. I took your class, a um, bunch of other things, and then worked retail for like four or five years, and then got in as a PA and did that for almost two years before I switched to boarding. Can I take a step back? When you were in high school figuring out what you were going to do with your life, <laughs> were you already like, I'm going to be a board artist? No, 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 no. I was, I wanted to work in animation. I didn't know, um, like, my family background is not, my, my, my great aunt, my, my, great aunt my, my aunt was artistic, but, like, they didn't know, like, jobs down here, like, in the industry. So uh, I just wanted to do animation. I think, um, like, when we were kids, like, the Disney Channel would do those, like, behind the scenes, like, little vignette things and they said they had one for tarzan that was like about animators and i was like i want to do that mm. so that was like i was like i'm gonna do 2d hand-drawn animation and then i got to college and they were like it's dead <laughs> you can't do that and so they pushed on 3d for like the first few years and then i took a uh, jay oliva storyboarding class um at my college and he was like the first person who was like because i wasn't that good at drawing but i like loved drawing and he was like well you can get better at drawing if you just like practice he's great i took yeah. his class yeah he's so. awesome and so after he told me that, I was like, all right, cool. Like, I might suck at this, but I can get better at it. And so I just, like, went all in. But that was, like, my junior year, so I had to do thesis and all that stuff. So I was like, all right, once I graduate. And then um, I don't know if you know J.J. Conway. Um, yes. So he was a couple uh, years ahead of me. And he had kind of gone a similar route because he also started out in production. So he was the one who told me about, like, Concept Design Academy and was, like, and, like, Noman and was, like, take classes and get these skills and like this is where you need to go and so um that's basically once i finished school i went to more school to like get into the industry that's a pretty common thing is you graduate and you're actually not really ready to work and you end up going to places like cda or online classes for another couple years before you're actually like have the portfolio that's ready for the industry yeah um what about you, Ethan? Yeah, similar CDA. I was growing up in small town Texas, and I heard a CDA, and I just decided, you know, like within the twenty-four hour. Right out of high mind. school. Or? Yeah, I was. I did like a semester in college, and I was like, "This is booty. This is booty <laughs> water. This is not, you know, all the the people teaching and stuff. They're all like old and dying." What kind of school was it? It was a college. It was a community college. And it was, you know, it's a standard community college where they're just using the 
students for money. And yeah, and then I heard of CDA and so also went to CDA and met um, Kevin, Kevin Chin's um, analytical figure drawing, you know. Yeah. Kevin was super cool. And I remember one time I was like, yeah, can I just like maybe just be in your home with you while you're drawing and like I can stand over you and just watch you for like a couple hours while you work? <laughs> and he's like, no, no, you can't. I was like, dang, because that would be awesome. Yeah. That's Kevin's cool. awesome. I learned I learned more of from Kevin to do background designing and painting than figure drawing, which was re really weird. That was my first job was background designing and painting, and I think I learned more through figure drawing, you know, how to do, like, line quality and stuff like that through Kevin. Yeah. What about you? Um, I When I was a kid, I used to draw with this old animator guy named Sam Singer. He animated on Snow White. Oh, cool. So I, we would go to the farmer's market just right over here and uh, sit and sketch people. And his roommate was a director at Nickelodeon. And um, they had just fired all the 2D animators at Disney and because they were, you know, Toy Story had just come out. And I remember his roommate was like, it's done. Animation's <laughs> done. It's gone. Because I was thinking like, oh, man, when I grow up, I'm going to go to animation school and like become a 2D animator like Glenn Keane, you know. And then that guy was like, it's dead. It's gone. I was like, shoot. And then I remember my, my parents were like, what are you going to be, an artist? You're like, draw money and put a hat on the sidewalk and people throw money in a hat. I'm like, that's not real. What are you <laughs> doing? Go get a real degree. So I went and got my mechanical engineering degree. And while I was there, I made friends with this guy, Kazuo Kibuishi, who uh, he made a book called Amulet. But he, he was like, hey, me and some friends are making this comic book for Alternative Press Expo. And it was a uh, it was called Flight. So he's like, you want to do uh, like a couple pages for this comic book? And we the first person who did it in the group did theirs in color we were gonna do it in black and white we're like dang that looks cool we should all do it in color <laughs> so we all did it in color and then we realized how expensive it would be to print it in color so we printed one copy <laughs> and we <laughs> put it in a binder just we already had the booth so we just put this comic on a <laughs> table and we wouldn't sell it because it was like the, we were like you can look at our comic yeah. that we made and the dude from Image Comics came over and looked at it. He's like, we'll publish this. Oh, dude, oh, that's cool. sick. Yeah, wow. so he published it. And wow. We were, I was still in college. Oh. Um, and then the reviews came out. Like They're like, this one's pretty good. And when it came to mind, I was like, what is this? Because <laughs> like, I didn't think at that time in my career, <laughs> I was in engineering school, I just skipped the writing portion of it. And I was like, really only cared about the drawing. So I was like, characters are running around and they were talking. And yeah. There was no story. <laughs> Who needs it? And yeah. and like people pointed it out. You know, I would read reviews. I was like, oh, I should learn like how to write a story. Because <laughs> like I was just, you know, you're young in your career. I was just thinking about drawing things. And I was into like Miyazaki and stuff. So I was drawing just weird stuff that made no sense. I was like, okay, I need to learn this story thing or try to actually like plan a story before I draw it. Oh, and crazy then I did idea. that. And then for the, the, like I kept doing it for these flight comics that we were making. Then I finally got a review that someone was like, the best story in here is this one. It was the one that I had done. I was like, all right, there we go. <laughs> I was like, okay, you can learn this stuff. <laughs> and um, so I graduated from engineering school. Wait, do you still have that? The flight books? Yeah. Yeah, they're, I got them all over my house. You can oh. order them on like Amazon. Oh, damn. They're still still around. Sometimes when I go to a bookstore, I'll go look and see if they have it still. Like sometimes they'll have them. But I graduated from engineering school, and I had met people because we were going down to Comic-Con for the book. It's like I met other people, and I went to a studio one day, and I saw drawings on the wall, and I was like, wait, people still draw? Like, cause I, in my mind, oh, it went to computers. There's no more artists at the studios. 
but there were still character designers and storyboard artists. And I was like, dude, wait, this is like a thing. And, uh, so I immediately moved to LA and tried to break in, but it took me another two years of moving to LA and trying to break in. I was like sneaking at an art center <laughs> and, and learning from people. This was before CDA even existed. Um, and then I went down to uh, the Watts Atelier. Do you oh, know that yeah. One? And like train there for a bit. And eventually I got good enough to get a character design job. And then, but I had applied to a couple places. I had also applied to DreamWorks Storyboarding. And while I was at this TV character design job, I got the offer to go to DreamWorks. And I went and told my show thinking they'd be like, well, we'll pay you more to stay. Yeah. <laughs> but they just went, you should take that job. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I took it and they canceled that show. <laughs> like nice. a week and fired everybody. I was like, oh, that's why my manager told me to take that job. Um, and then I was at DreamWorks for like 15, 16, oh, no, maybe 18 years. Dang. But that's basically where I learned. Like I had this really cool mentor named Jeff Lynch and he was the head of story in Iron Giant. Oh, then cool. he went to go be a second unit director for Sam Raimi for all the Spider-Man stuff. <sighs> then he came back and worked on Iron, uh, or no, The Incredibles. Mm -hmm. And then he came over on Megamind. And oh. he basically was like, he was a veteran kind of badass. And he was like, I don't really want to actually like storyboard can i do thumbnails you can give me some like trainees to like finish my stuff so like basically at first he was just handing me thumbnails and i was like cleaning up and then he's like well you try to go board that half of it while i work on this and it yeah. and it was a thing where i would show my sequences and he would sit there and draw over every single panel like and it was mostly like i was doing a lot of parallels mm -hmm. and he was forcing uh like angles on almost everything. So like just slightly adding two point perspective in every direction and in, in shifting and making a lot of Z axis mo movement versus like, you'll have a natural tendency when you're starting boarding to keep everything moving in the X, Y plane. And he was just like pretty much only do Z movement, like almost no left, right, up, down. So like he would, he would, just draw on top of every board and like throughout I worked with him it must have been like a year or more but like each time there'd be like maybe I'd get one panel in the whole sequence that he did red line over and I remember by the end of the year there was a sequence where he would put the pen up and go okay nice put the pen up okay put the pen up okay and it was the first one where he didn't red line a single he's like okay that's pretty good nice I was like, yeah <laughs> Um, and that was it was like art school nice. so that's kind of like he trained me what a perfect scenario just like to have somebody constantly like how long did y'all do that together? like a year that's that's like yeah. the most perfect training that you can do did you ever have that moment where people are like putting notes on your stuff and then finally they just didn't do any notes or did very little notes you know I, not really, just because the way things are, like, at least in my career, it's, like, you do stuff, and then it gets handed off. Oh, right. And whether yeah. it stays, I mean, with TV, like, the schedule so breakneck, and yeah. whether it stays, I mean, sometimes, like, you know, when I see the episode, I'll be like, oh, great, most of what I did is there, so good job. And, you know, but there's always, like, a couple changes. I haven't, I, I actually, like, would love at some point in my career to have that, you know what I mean? And there, and I've been lucky, like, I've worked with a lot of directors who will take my hand and be like, hey, like here's some, you know, general advice or here's some things you need to work on, which I really... Oh, you're saying you're so good that you don't get notes. No, no, no. I get hella notes. Oh, okay. What I'm saying is, it's like, uh, because um, because of the way it is with TV, like... You, you just do it and it's done, right? Like You, you do it and it's done. Or, or, like, you do it, here are the notes, and you go fix it. And then it's... Oh. And then you... And then it goes to the revisionist or right. I was the revisionist on Invincible. So like I was doing other people's notes, uh, things like that. So, um, so I've been lucky that like, because there isn't usually a lot of time for that. Yeah. I've had a lot of directors who've taken the time to like talk to me about it, you know, talk to me about my work and give me advice. And I always try to take people up on it when they're willing to do it. But it is one of those things where I feel like that kind of 
like relationship is like kind of dying in this industry yeah like we don't have those moments anymore where you can like sit down with someone and go over their work really meticulously and be like this is how you can like push yourself to be the next level um i mean it's why like i still take classes and stuff because i'm like i i have to do it myself you know like unless i end up somewhere where like we have the time to do those moments where we can go through everything like and say like these are all the things you got to do i just try to like see what changed like if I, if I didn't get to change it like see what did change and like how I can take that into my own work did you right. do you feel like when you're doing revisionist are you working with one director or usually yeah do you do you feel like you kind of soak up and learn because you're yeah. like working I th- I think I had the this last year or so when I was on invincible cuz I had I had kind of like not a linear career trajectory I guess because I had done boards I took, um, I actually sought out the revisionist role on Inv- Invincible specifically because it was such a higher level show than I'd ever worked on before and I'd never done revisions. It's one of the mm-hmm. most popular shows. Yeah. And I was like, I know the people working on this are like next level and I want to be on that level. So I want to take that, like, and it felt like that year was like being I, in school. I would say for anybody watching this, take jobs if you can afford to. Yeah. <laughs> take, I have to caveat that because not everyone can afford to do this, but. If you can afford to choose your jobs by who you're going to learn from, especially early in your career, over, you know, the bigger paycheck or the... Yeah, that know. was that was the thing I had to think about because I'd been working in mostly adult, um, like, primetime stuff before that. And the paychecks are decent and they pay well. And But I was like, I want to do this. Like, this is what I want to do. So I knew, like, I'd be going down um, a level and, like, taking a pay cut. But it was, like, I, I feel like I was in school because... Well, I wasn't necessarily like boarding. Um, my director was going over with me, like, you know, what was changing, why it was changing. Also, and her name's Haley Herrick. Everybody should check her out on Instagram. But um, she, uh, she's she uh, directed the Adam Eve special um, of the Invincible um, episodes that came out. That was like did really well, and the one that just aired too. Um, but uh, she would actually have us sit in the edits too with her. Oh. Yeah. Nice. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. That is that is really good. Yeah. So Dang. she and like and me and um uh Karan uh Clark, who was the other revisionist, she would like basically sit us down and like um talk a lot about like the process of like the whole episode. In in that experience, because like on, on a feature show, I would board a sequence and then I'd get called down to edit and we'd watch it and I'd see which shots they cut out. And it that was a such a learning experience because then the next time you board, you're like Oh, they took out all the times I did X, you yeah. know, or oh, they removed any time this, like okay, and you learned how to like uh, be more economic. Mm-hmm. Is it a similar experience? Yeah, uh, similar to like one of the cool things about it, and the episode that we that we were doing that with in particular, or like the last, it was the last one that we worked on. Um, uh, we it was fun because since we were there and we were in the edit, there were a couple moments where we were like oh crud like we need a pose and so Karan and I would be like I got it like one of us would like Mm -hmm. call it and then we do it and then we would think about like oh um because like the sequence has this like we need to add this or oh actually like we don't need this shot because it's like show like there's so much going on and like sometimes there's like especially with fight scenes there's like a lot of double beats sometimes and they're just like we don't need this double beat it's reading without this you know Mm -hmm. so um because it was a very action heavy um episode and uh yeah, it was really it was really fun. Um, I feel like yeah, I I hope I get to do something like that again in my career because I the goal is to direct eventually, and I want to like learn as much as I can in the next couple of years because I like want to do that eventually. Nice. And, you know, when I was first starting out as a revisionist, I asked my directors. I was on Voltron, and I was like, "Y'all are going to edit, right? Uh, can I just like sit in on that? To, you know, to think." It. And he was just like, "No." No, <laughs> this is you know just like the tone of like this is the this is where the big boys go to do. It. I'm like yeah, but like I could probably learn a lot, you know. But you got your know. little backpack on. Yeah, <laughs> except I didn't. I just worked like two days straight, and I didn't sleep. And now you know, like I have a chance to learn something. And I don't know why uh, y'all have been on those productions where you have that little bastard that wants to learn. <laughs> I was always that guy because, like, again, because I never went to art school, I was bothering everybody. I was going to every like I remember my, one of my first office mates was this board artist named Toby Shelton. 
Oh, Toby's and, really good. Yeah, and he did the character designs for Darkwing Duck and like a bunch of those shows. Um, and I would just like kind of just watch him draw, and he just hit the undo button, and he he was one of those guys where it, everything looked perfect. Like there was, yeah. he would always undo so that there wasn't a bad stroke mm-hmm. on the page, you know. Um, and I'd always just like watch watch what he would do and kind of try to learn from that there's another guy tom owens that i'd always copy his boards um he was drawing stuff on like how to train your dragon and stuff and i'd always be like check it out man how are you doing that he was this dude who this is an interesting story so i was trying to learn to draw as good as him and in my mind i'm like if i keep studying his stuff and i keep trying maybe one day i'll be as good as him and then I was having lunch with him, and he told me he, he graduated high school on a Friday and became a character designer at Disney the following Monday, <laughs> yeah. and he could just always draw. Mm-hmm. I was like, what do you mean? You could ju-? He said, I could just always draw. And I was like, how do you draw? Can you tell me? Like, how do you draw so well? He's like, well, no, I just draw. Yeah, just and I it. was like, oh, he's like a savant. Oh. Like, I, no matter how hard I work, it's like, you know, those people that play the piano. Yeah. I was like, I'll, I'm just not that. I'm not a savant. I'm never going to like catch up if I study. But it was interesting because like this other at the time I was on Megamind and um, my director came by and he's like, man, you got something a lot of board artists don't have. Like you can write really well. Um, and, and he was like, awesome. We'll have you write a bunch of scenes. So they kept giving me scenes to write. Uh and I just thought to myself, like, okay, I'm, like, chasing this goal. I'm, like, I one day I'll draw. And I'm, like, I think it's an unattainable goal. But I've been told that, like, I could write pretty well. So I'm just going to, like, not care so much what my drawings look like. Mm. Like, I've just kind of got to – I don't draw like that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't draw at the savant level, and I'm, like – but what if I just focus on like the thing I'm good at and try to get better and better and better and better at that? Because I was spending like hours a day like trying to technically be a better draftsman. Yeah. And then when I shifted gears and I'm like, let me just, okay, I kind of figured out what I do do well. Let me just like focus on that all day. Then my career like really took off because before it was kind of like, eh. but then when I when I figured out what I was, like my personal natural spot, you know, and just honed in on that. That was, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that is awesome. What's your natural spot? I don't know. I feel like I have a lot of um, soft skills that a lot of people I think kind of undercut. Cause I, I started off my career in production. Mm. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, there's a lot of things that I feel like I'm like flawed in that I'm like, I want to get better at like, you know, draftsman, better board artist, better this, better that. But the one thing that I'm really good at, like when I'm in a production is I'm very aware of like usually where everything is at. And it has served me well this last year, especially because I've done so much revisionist work. It's like, it served me well knowing where we are. And it's also part of the reason I want to direct is because I think I'd be good at this because I am able to catch a lot of things that are like falling apart, you know, in the production and, and, and notice things and, um, and, it served me really well in the last uh, year, especially because, um, you know, knowing knowing how all the pieces fit together, I think a lot of, I don't think a lot of people, I mean, there's, you know, we all love the drawing and I think that's what people are most attracted to and like the storytelling, but knowing how all the pieces fit together, like part of my big goal is like, not only do I want to work on amazing, cool shows and do like awesome, cool shit, but like, I want to have a life outside of animation. So like having the ability, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to hit the mic. Um, <laughs> having the ability to do all of that um, is like something that's important to me and like learning how to be economical and like how to make like the best shows that look the best and like are the best also in like a healthy way. So like, that's been one thing that I, I realized like this last year, like I really do, I'm really good at is like noticing how everything fits together and like being good at my job essentially and like realizing like oh, okay we caught this mistake caught this we're gonna need to do this like you know especially like knowing what's coming next on the pipeline too because like sometimes people don't think about like you know oh we're shipping this episode 
in a week and we haven't done any action notes, uh, we need to make time for that, you know, and, and sometimes you have to be the person to like put your foot down and say like, we're doing this because. So you'd make a good showrunner. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're putting forth the initiative or whatever. And that's more often than not shows need that. That's, that's a huge problem that I run into is like, wait, y'all didn't do this thing. Oh, y'all didn't do this thing. Oh, I isn't guess it, I'm supposed isn't to. Isn't it weird how somehow the show gets finished? I, when sometimes I'm like, how did this get done? This was so chaotic. One thing that I, I've talked about with like a lot of, I mean, I know the union is trying to do this more, um, but like having more like leadership and like, like management training classes for people, um, the studio should do it. Because one thing is, is like to be good, like to be a good board artist, to be a good character designer, a good designer, you have to be like all in on this one thing. And the the people management and like the knowing how all these other pieces fit together the other jobs how they all work knowing how, all of that is it's a lot and the fact is a lot of times people are promoted to like directors or showrunners and they're like okay go make a show and then you're like i okay um like what steps yeah. need to happen and a lot of people don't know and it's kind of crazy to me that like these companies are throwing all these money at these shows and i'm like you aren't going to give the person that you're like giving all these responsibilities to at least like a week to like learn like how to how they all work together and it's unfortunate too because there are some people that are really amazing people who have had like opportunities and then because they couldn't like sin like swim well they're artists right yeah like, they're like people i mean i don't know about y'all but i'm stuck behind a desk got social skills and people skills like didn't really have them that much didn't really need them yeah yeah yeah, and so I, I I feel like it would be better all around if we had more resources for like people to you know learn those because I because I you know I think artists make the best showrunners obviously because yeah you Ethan know. you would you have the temperament for a good showrunner I think just kill somebody I think a, I think a big <laughs> part of it is staying calm in a storm is a big like um mm. is a big part of being a good showrunner. I got some good advice from this one showrunner be like towards the beginning of when I was showrunning. He said he had done two shows by this point, but he was talking about the first show he did. He just thought all his notes in his own mind and never said it, <gasps> never verbalized it. So people would be pitching him stuff, character designs, and he was just thinking like, I hate this one thing. But then it would go to color and he'd still be thinking, oh, I hate this one thing. And then it would go to something else. And then maybe he'd finally get the guts to like say it, but it had gone through like five stages before he, but he thought it like when he first saw it and he was like, the second you think of something, just say it, verbalize it, put it out there in the world. Like, don't be afraid. Don't just, cause he's like, I was living there and I was like halfway through my show. And I was like, I hate everything. And just every time I see everything, I hate it all. And I just never told anybody. And, they're like, and then he realized he, on his next show, he's like, why was I having all these conversations in my mind? Like, I was afraid to just say, just make the nose different. Make the, you know, I don't like that shirt. Like, you know, whatever the characters are or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, like, why why didn't I just say it? <laughs> so uh, there's a gray area to that, right? Like, you got to find balance because I was directing on some kind of video game thing. And I was just every single time they gave me something back, I had a note. And you, there's at some point that you have to draw the line, right? Like after a certain amount of notes, you have to be like, okay, it's good enough to move on. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I yeah. also, I also noticed when I was show running, I had to think to myself, can I afford to give this note? Because, mm -hmm. and I had to think in terms of like the uh, the man hours at night, and literally, if you can't afford it, don't let the words come out of your mouth, because you can't say something like. I wish we could change that yeah. because now that person feels like they have to go do it Yeah. or they feel, you know what I mean? Like you're putting people in a, this awkward situation. You can't really afford it, but I would say give there's a, yeah, there's a balance between not saying anything and you're not leading the team and biting your tongue and don't say things you can't afford to do. Yeah. Just, just don't say it like then, then think it. Yeah. But <laughs> Well, the worst is when, uh, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you guys have dealt with directors who expect you to read their minds and then 
you're in the final hour and then they're like why didn't you do that why didn't you do this and i'm like you never told me to do this <laughs> read their mind yeah do you have any bad experiences with directors that you want to name yes <laughs> um, <laughs> an alphabetical order to. no <laughs> no i mean i just I, people you know yeah i mean and, and honestly i think too like a lot of this industry sometimes you find people that you work really well with and sometimes you have people who they're great but you know for whatever reason your communication style doesn't gel and it's fine it's nothing. communication's hard it is hard it is really hard yeah so um but i've had mostly good experiences and the in the bad experiences i've had it's kind of like at this point i don't know i don't take things personally so i'm always just kind of like eh, you know <laughs> Next time. That's, I feel like that's gold. Yeah. To not be able to take things personally, that's very difficult. But I kind of like, I because sometimes when when you're at a movie studio, you you might be on a movie and you might totally click and your sensibilities are perfect with that director and that producer and like you're kind of you're it's great. And then like I remember I went on to a movie and like I didn't take it personally. But like, um, I was not on the same wavelength in terms of what I was doing, with their what they were looking for, and I got fired off that movie and moved on to another one. But I, it's funny because like you would think maybe real early in your in your uh, career that would hurt your feelings, but I just went, yeah, no, I was not the right. Mm-hmm. That was like a square peg in a round hole, and I'm like, love you guys, but I should go to this other movie because yeah. like we don't. Like, I'm not doing what you guys want. You know, I just don't do that kind of thing. Yeah. What is your favorite type of scene to board and why? Oh, it used to be action. As soon as I found out that you can move the camera in Storyboard Pro, I was like, oh, this is going to be so sick. I'm going to make everybody really, like, nauseous and move the camera around. And so it was action for the longest time because I would, you know, film myself. I just strip completely naked and film myself doing all the action poses. That was really fun. Uh, having my neighbors watch that. Um, but right. now, well, maybe I'll take back the show. Right yeah. <laughs> 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 but now, I I could care less about action. I don't care about action. I don't care about fighting. None of that is just boring to me now. Now I care about like emotional scenes uh, just you know just the standard ots not even ots just centering the characters and uh the context or the subtext actually of the the scene i the writing to answer your question is writing so i guess i don't really like storyboarding i guess i hate art <laughs> now that i think about it i just like the writing part yeah yeah and i don't really like good making good drawings anywhere i mean it's fun you know to be able to like Turn off your brain or whatever and make a good drawing. But the writing is, you know. Yeah, sometimes I look at your drawings and I'm like, damn, man, those are crazy. Oh, I was like, damn, those really suck. No, they're so good. Thank you. Yeah, that's fun to you know, turn off the brain sometimes for me. Yeah. What about you? You like action? I do like action. Um, I feel like I'm still like, because I moved into the action world, I guess, more last year. So I'm still like getting my feet wet with it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm having fun, like, learning how to do, like, I, tr- I try to do crazy shit, or I'm trying to, to do more crazy shit. Um, although I think one thing I struggle with is that I, I tend to like it things to be a little bit more realistic in how I board. And so, like, um, I, I'm i trying to, like, I don't know, like, not stress too much about the, like, where everything, people's feet are and things like that. And just, oh, like, yeah. you know, make it, like, just do something because it looks cool. Um, which is like kind of where I'm at right now um, in terms of like pushing myself. But I, I love doing acting scenes, emotional scenes too. And oh, yeah. romance scenes I got to do. That's or cool. done. Well, I actually, I don't know if I can say, I say what it is because it's a spoiler for that show. But I got to do some freelance for a show last year. And um, I got to do like a romantic scene. And it was really fun to like oh, push cool. it and um, be like, these two characters are so in love. Um, and it's really tragic. Um <laughs> too uh so those are those are really fun to do um and i also really like like ambiance scenes like um or like when uh uh i worked on the show little demon for a little while it was really fun to work on um and we had a lot of like they went to like a lot of like crazy worlds in it like crazy fantasy hell worlds and so we got to do a lot of like i don't know like moments where we're like showing off a location in like a really like cinematic way 
Oh. And those are fun. I, I really like the way You're talking about like a Ghibli moment where the yeah. camera's just like cool no, pan. We had literally. Wind is blowing. We had literally that. We, they go to this like. It's like Limbo. Is it the episode? They go to like Limbo where like souls are like going to their different afterlives that they're like picking. Yeah. And it's like a big convention. So like the souls all look kind of crazy. And so we had like literally th- those moments where we're like panning. And like those things are like really fun to do, especially on that show because that show we were allowed to like. It was a Harmony rig show, but, like, we were allowed to, like, kind of be, like, a little weird and, like, just come up with shit. So it was pretty freeing because they were, like, just draw whatever you want and, like, make it weird. And um, so it's it's fun when you get to do stuff like that because then you're, like, well, I'm just going to come up with some crazy stuff and hopefully it sticks. Yeah, I take back my answer. It's, like, ambiance yeah. is really cool. Whenever you can hit a mood, you know, Ghibli does that so well, well where – it's like if I can imagine the soundtrack or the score coming in or like the sounds, you know, of the wind blowing and it's nighttime or just putting you in like a, a small moment that's very calm. Oh, I love that. I love that so much. There, there was a scene like that in the second episode of Kipo that I boarded mm-hmm. where it's just like all silent and you're meeting Benson, the character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He up just, on the. He's just walking up towards camera and yeah. he finds like a tape and he puts it in. He's listening and. Yeah, he's climbing, yeah. and then my favorite scene. The whole thing is is it's so funny because it's like when I was at DreamWorks, ninety nine percent of my job was writing jokes, mm-hmm. like verbal like jokes uh, between Megamind and Boss Baby. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> write jokes. So it was funny to like do a scene with, and I always tell students that I'm like, learn how to write dialogue, like. Don't do these silent scenes. Like you're just being lazy. You just don't want to write dialogue, you know. But then that scene was so fun to board. There's like no dialogue in it, you know, because like everything had to stand on its own visually. Yeah, it's like character though, right? That was his mm-hmm. character. You're you're sharing that moment with him. Yeah. But you, yeah, you have to write his character to the point where you know, like that's this is the scene to to be alone with him. And yeah, I really like that scene. Oh, thanks. That was nice. Uh, yeah. it's, when I was getting trained by Jeff Lynch and he came like him and Brad Bird were buddies, you know, um, and they had this sort of like show everything in the board. They were some of the first people to do that because like before, like a lot of you look at the older Disney boards, it's almost like they needed to go to the layout phase yeah. to make any sense. They were almost like suggestions of what could happen purely from a story standpoint but they weren't like planning out the shots so specifically just like egghead yeah big circle um so like i i got trained pretty heavily on megamind from jeff like in action so i got like really pretty like decent i i ended up i would always get called like on a friday like can you do the third act of this like this weekend and turn it in Monday. Oh my like God. that was my job for years. It's like, can you do the third act this weekend? Sick. And it was always crazy camera move action. So I got like really good at that stuff. And then, and then I also got really good at like just coming up with jokes, but it was, there was almost like, I remember like when I transitioned from DreamWorks where nobody took it too seriously. It just it was almost like doing a stand up set. Like you go write jokes and you you do your almost like a stand up set when you pitch your scene and then at the end of the five years you're like, Oh yeah, we made a movie. I <laughs> forgot we were making a movie. But like um I went to work on Wish Dragon with Chris Applehans and it, it, Chris like I kinda was doing the same thing. Just like, Oh, I'll just write a bunch of jokes and it was like wait wait take a break okay you're friends with chris you want to make sure he actually makes a good movie (laughs) like stop thinking about just this one pitch because we would do hundreds of versions of things Mm -hmm. and it would end up in edit and they would recut it and he would come back and you'd reboard it and they'd spend seven years on it but then with this it was like we have okay we're doing this at a lower budget we're not doing hundreds of versions of stuff like actually try to make the scene better (laughs) yeah but it was a good reset because then when i went to Kipo, I kind of had changed my brain a little bit of like, let's try to make this good (laughs) Mm. versus just like having fun with the pitch. You think it's best to learn that way to be loosey goosey and then move into that structure of like, okay, because 
I don't know, for me, my mindset is like, there is no time, there is no money to have, I don't want to say to have fun, but to be able to throw those ideas around, like you have to have the the opening, the middle, the end, it has to be good, you know, like there's I, there's no time for... I'm going to say something controversial, but... Um, don't do it. Okay, go ahead. The way, <laughs> the way DreamWorks was set up at the time, it didn't feel like there was a possibility of making a great film. Huh. Because of the way the le- leadership was and like all the decisions were, let's throw a dance in here because we think that gets, you know, like they yeah. weren't decisions make, ma- like it wasn't like the Pixar model was like, we're trying to make a great movie. It was like, how do we get the most people to show up on the Friday, the opening day? Yeah. Like, so it, it wasn't ever like, you would your soul would be crushed if you were the only one trying to make a great movie yeah and yeah. it was never going to happen so everyone just switched over to like let's have a good time Might as well have fun and like i get that and treat it more like let's all make each other laugh and like have a blast yeah which was super fun work environment but like you would have gone insane if you were like i here's how we make this movie great and you would have just got like nobody would have been like yeah that's so funny because i feel like <laughs> especially for like mega mind like how to train your dragon like those are genuinely great movies like people love them yeah now i don't know if it felt that way when you're making them <laughs> <laughs> the directors were trying to do their best on those movies but there's still another layer of stuff above them mm. so i mean they That's the other thing, too, is like if you're a director, you're trying to, you know, hit your head against the wall. You might be trying to do that. and You're trying to make it as great as you can. Um, But then when you get all like I was a, you know, low level board artist. So it's like everyone just ends up like treating it differently. Yeah. You know? Um, Yeah. If you're that if you're a board artist, I feel like maybe this is just my feelings. I'm always like I want to do my best work, but like at the end of the day, we're making stuff for like other people. So yeah. it's like, if I get too precious, it's like, you'll go crazy. Cause it's not my baby, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you're trying, your job is to make the thing, the person above you is trying to make, Yeah. not what you're trying to make, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe that's a better way to put it. Yeah. It's like, if you, if you suddenly think of yourself as like the director, mm-hmm. you're in a bad spot. Yeah, you're supposed to be a finger, a finger of the hand, of the <laughs> arm, of the the wrist. Yeah, of the wrist, or are you a toe, if you want. <laughs> you know what? Too, I will say, when you're working on something, okay, I don't know if you're like this, but like, like I remember coming home and like talking to my wife about Kipo, and like. In my mind, I just see only flaws in the things I do. Mm -hmm. So, like, even the movies at DreamWorks that I worked on that you mentioned, I am just seeing everything wrong with it. And Mm -hmm. then I remember, like, I'm coming home and I'm like, oh, man, you're going to hate this show. It's like, and then she watches. She's like, this show's good. What what are you talking about? I was like, really? Do you like it? You know? I feel like. I sometimes have that, but I also feel like recently because I've worked on some productions where it was just like hard that if something comes out, I'm like, damn, <laughs> it actually came out. Oh. Like, it exists in the world. Yeah. Like, uh, I heard that's pretty rare. <laughs> yeah, especially it? nowadays. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I have like, you know, I mean, I, I definitely do see the flaws. I also kind of feel like I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm just a little bit more forgiving about stuff because I feel like, yeah, I mean, things are it's so hard to get things made now. And so like, I'm like the fact that it comes out like halfway decent. And I'm like, mm, that, that's the other thing. Like after a show ran, I used to judge shows before that. And after I made a show, I was like, I don't know how any good show ever gets made. <laughs> like, it's just a lot of luck, honestly. Yeah. Like you're lucky that you got good writers. You're lucky that you got good art director is good for it. You're lucky that you got a good outsourcing studio. Like, yeah. it's just pieces just fall so into place. Just because so much of it is out of your hands. If yeah. one of those things goes wrong, your yeah. show won't be good. Yeah. You know? And even then, like, you know, even when I do notice, because I do notice the mistakes. I think it's just more that I, like, maybe because of where I'm at, because I'm just, like, a board artist. Like, I'm just like, well, it's not, 
that's not my mistake. If it's my mistake, I will be like, oh, damn, I'm mad about it. Oh. But uh, <laughs> if it's like, you know, I notice like an animation error or something, I'm like, well, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would you say that you've experienced life? <laughs> now we're getting serious. Yeah. 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 Like you, you've, you like understand yourself pretty well, and I think so. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> getting deep. How 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 old were? You? Was there a time when you're like, I think I was 29 before I was like, oh, I never did anything like to find myself or mm. like because I. I went straight from just like, I'm drawing all day, I'm drawing all day, I'm making animation, 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 animation. I feel like I was 29 before I looked up. I'm like, wait, what am I doing with my life? What's going on? Yeah. I think that there's a point when you're recreating recreations of recreations, which is like, oh, I saw this Spielberg film and I saw this other TV show. It's like, I want to do that TV show, which is just another version of another TV show. And I think you're at a good point whenever you're just kind of recreating life as opposed to recreating shows, you know. And I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I realized that, you know, a few years ago, but I think that's the difference between good directors and yeah, bad directors, I would say. There's people like caught in the loop of, uh, I guess, Hollywood, you know, mm. or caught in the loop of recreating shows yeah I, which I, I see a lot of i would argue though in terms of like the difference between a good director and a bad director yeah there there's some weird ethereal thing where some people are just good at stuff for no reason <laughs> and some people just never get good at it yeah. it's just like a it's just random you know maybe i should say like maybe not good directors and bad directors but um uh, because like there's a difference between making a show that is going people are going to walk out of the theater you know making a film where they feel like they've it's changed them changed their life like they're more introspective or whatever compared to just like a popcorn fun film like i guess i don't know there's a few that i can think of but like trolls at first i was like what is this <laughs> you know i was like what is this for kids or something i don't know. i don't but then I was like, oh, you know what? This was fun. And it, I thought it was very, really fun, but it didn't like change my life fundamentally. I don't know. There's like different types of consumption, mm. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would say, because you, you mentioned like life earlier, but it, I've thought about this a lot because it has taken me like longer to break in than a lot of other people. And I've lived a lot of, I've lived a life. You know what I mean? Like I've yeah. done a lot of random things and I've had a pretty random journey um and what do you what do you think because i have a weird when i see kids who went to art school and go straight into yeah. the industry i think what they're saying sounds crazy to me compared to someone who didn't go to art school and it took a couple years to yeah to get in do you find that i i do i think i i, I feel like people should like live a little bit before you break it. I mean, it's great if you get a job, you should get a job, like money and like yeah, care yourself. It. Like that's like hierarchy. No, of some needs. of those kids are great. But yeah, awesome. but I, I think like living a life, I think it makes you a better artist in general because you have more experience to draw upon and not just pulling from, like you said, like pop culture or movies. You're drawing from like your own life and things that you've been through. And um, and it, I, it's hard to like, because I think, Especially like, I mean, I don't know. I remember being that age, like when I was in college, I was like, I have to get a job in animation. Like right when I graduated, I have to like have it all figured out. Yeah, yeah. And then I didn't. And I, I lived like for, you know, four or five years, like this very different life than I live now. Um, and at the time I was very like bitter about it. Cause I was like, I, I didn't break in. And like some of my friends had, but now that like, like I look back, I'm like, well, I got to do a bunch of other random stuff that I wouldn't have been able to do. And I lived this whole other life that I didn't that I wouldn't have been able to live if I had just started working right away, like in the industry. So I, I don't regret it at all. And I think, um, you know, even though I maybe am more behind than I would like to be at this point in my life, you know, at the same time I'm like, well, I'm still improving, I'm still growing. Like every day is a new challenge. So it's like I feel like you're ahead of the game <laughs> if you live 
Because even though you're telling, like, I don't think you're going to be retelling those stories exactly, right? Yeah. But the, the things that you go through emotionally as a human, it translates. Yeah. Like how you're going to have characters act in a scene. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not just hitting marks or whatever. You're not just hitting beats on a, a script. Mm-hmm. You're going to add, like, human experience. Yeah. Which I think that's that's the sign of a good board artist. Speaking of human experience, do we want to talk about AI? <laughs> oh. Wow, that transition. <laughs> <laughs> sure. sure. You know it's funny, like my initial thought when I first saw it, like because before you knew that it was scraping or stealing. Yeah. My first thought was like, oh thank God I don't have to draw my backgrounds anymore. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I my initial thought was like uh, almost excited i was like oh hell yeah and then you start then you find out like wait they stole a bunch of artwork <laughs> what the hell yeah i think when i first saw it i mean i'm not gonna lie like when i first when dolly came out i forgot, I forgot what show i was on we started making like really like the most cursed stuff we could think of because like uh. people were playing with it because they were like this is funny oh you're making messed up looking stuff yeah you just like type something and you get something like really messed up and you're like this is hilarious and then i didn't really think about it until I think all the shit started to hit the fan and they were like, oh, this is when it's stealing. Also, like, because Dolly was free, so it was just like a funny little thing people were playing with. But yeah, I totally didn't understand yeah. that it was, they were scraping art. Yeah. But then they're charging people because like Midjourney and all those programs, like they cost a lot of money to like have access to. So, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you have to pay. Like that's, this is the part that's like, ugh, this is the part that makes me go crazy because it's not just like that they're stealing all of this data across the internet um, that is they don't have the rights to but it's the added of using the program of like mid journey and these other programs you have to pay to use them and they're not cheap so these companies are making a profit not only like not only is it stolen off of stolen data but they're making a profit because they're paying people to use their software and the other hilarious thing i don't know if you guys have seen this but some of these prompt engineers have started getting mad at each other for art theft because yeah, I saw that. that's cool <laughs> yeah that's like, so use my prompt and i'm like <laughs> dude that's so funny Oh, man. Yeah, I love it. It's so good. It's great. Um, you should get a couple of those dudes on here. <laughs> and like God. sitting across from each other just arguing. You did, don't understand. Did man. you see what happened at South by Southwest this weekend? No, what's that? Uh, the film festival. Uh, yeah. They had a like, uh, the I guess it was before screening or something. They had some like AI tech demo. The crowd booed them. Oh, they booed wow. all the AI tech guys. Ooh. What's a touchy subject? Like, um, what's his name? And Atlanta was going to build that whole, was it eight hundred million dollar facility? And then he, uh, Tyler Perry. Oh yeah. And then he saw the AI and just, says, ah, I don't need to build that. Mm-hmm. I could just use AI. Do you think, um, if the AI was alive <laughs> and intelligent, would it bother you that it learned from our art? Like a li- if if it was a living creature. I mean, if it was a living creature, I feel like that's a totally different conversation. That's like, <laughs> what's the oh my god, what's the Will Smith movie? Um, Easy there. Uh, is it I Am Robot? Yeah, yeah. I love that movie. I, I I mean, I would I don't want to be friends with a robot, but you don't. No, I would. I totally would. If it was yeah. like Sunny from that movie. Yeah. Like, and then it and then you taught it how to draw, and it could draw. Yeah. Then it would be fine. Well, that's like that whole thing where he's like he's like, can you write a symphony? And he's like, can you? <laughs> Apparently they can though. So <laughs> even without Dude, them. I'm still shocked like that someone posted that one piece thing today. I don't know if you saw that. No. With is it Sora that does the moving things? And um all the comments are like, This is AI trash because everyone's mad that it's stealing. But at the same point you're like, I mean shit, that's better than I could draw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean part of me is I'm not super worried and I, maybe I'm being naive about this, but I, I do feel like just from like what I've read about how like the tech works and stuff like that, I think it it has a tendency, like the, the, one of the big problems they have is the AIs have tend to eat themselves. So like they'll cannibalize themselves and then like they look really cool for a little while and then it like completely stops looking cool. Cause it keeps only, sorry, I keep touching the mic. I need to stop touching the mic. Um, it, uh, it'll like keep learning off of other AI and then it like starts to look weird and then you get like the bizarre stuff. And I think, um, I think of it as like if it's a novelty and that's like what it is. It doesn't really bother me of it existing, 
But I think like this whole idea of like it actually replacing human artists, I don't, I'm not, I don't know. I'm, I'm not actually that like worried about it. I am worried about like the next few years of companies going all in and trying to be like, let's learn how this works. And then like they try to do it and then realize they can't. But like in that meantime, like people will be out of work because they're going to be trying to not hire artists and just use AI. Like that's more of my concern. I'm not as concerned about like, all shows in the future will like be made with AI. If that makes sense. I wonder. I'm trying to think of what I think of it. Like, in reality, I don't see our jobs going away that fast. Yeah. It's like, if you really tried to sit down and like make a show with AI, mm-hmm. you you still need to hire like the best artists, even if they were using the AI to fix stuff. Because, like, you can't give it notes. It's more work to fix it, too. Like, I that Netflix short that came out that used AI backgrounds, apparently the human artist who worked on it was like, I redid, like, most of them. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know about this. Yeah, there was, like, a Netflix short that came out, and they only had, like, one human artist for the backgrounds. But even that artist was like, I had to redo a bunch of it Mm. because the AI can't take notes. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's AI, right? So eventually it's it would get to that point where you just type, like it's do we would do unthinkable they do unthinkable feats. I or think you just tell it to do a bunch of. I I do think there's gonna be a point where you put on your like VR headset and you talk to the AI to build your virtual set. Yeah, just like well, you can do that now. And you, but but it like but like in a pro- in a production and yeah. you grab your camera and then you make your AI. But, puppeted character design and but I, I think i think that could yeah. come at some point i think part of the issue is and this has been kind of my frustration with talking about it is i think there are two different things happening right there's generative ai which is the stuff where you like prompt it in and you get stuff and then there's like ai tools and i don't really i don't know how you guys feel about this but like every artist i've talked to that like use because we technically we are like rigging a model yeah we stuff. use ai tools every day that we don't even yeah. think about right like automating is technically i, I don't AI. have a problem with anything other than the scraping stuff yeah like i i don't I, like you know our spider verse like the thing they did with the um uh the lines like mm-hmm. to get that line effect like they used ai for that but it wasn't generative ai it was an ai tool that they used to help them like refine it and help them do like a very tedious process that would have taken like forever that it helped them like like you know make an automated process that they could do and then they went through and like went by hand and like fixed it and refined it like i don't think anybody like any of the tedious shit we have to do as artists i don't think anybody's like, going to be upset at having a machine take that part of our job it's more yeah. like the creative part of our job so that's like that's where i'm at with it because i'm like if it makes my job easier i don't have a problem with it i haven't really had to think about it like this but i think the only thing that really uh i don't like about it is that how it's going to change new artists coming into the mm-hmm. field their mindset of like uh the scraping thing like the like yeah let's just say there's no such thing as scraping or whatever but even just as ai taking tools and like, uh, you don't have to learn how to paint really oh, yeah you know so new students coming into this field they might a lot of them might not just be like well i'm just gonna go to get a completely different job and not tell my story or not mm. do the art that i think you know is important and just thinking that they, they they have no purpose of making art, and that sucks because yeah. I feel like you're missing out on a lot of uh, future directors. Yeah, you know, there, there was a weird thing that happened where when photography came at, out, you you know, you when you go find those old magazines, like mm-hmm. everything was drawn, mm-hmm. like oh, everything yeah. was painted, like. All the advertisements for paintings. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as they switch to photography, up until like, I want to say the video game concept art came out, like artistry and draftsmanship like almost died. Like even when you look at the 90s comics, like they weren't (laughs) that great at like technical draftsmanship. Like that sort of lineage of, the hundreds of people passing down just that Andrew Loomis kind yeah. of yeah, Rockwell, line decker yeah. Rockwell. Yeah. It almost like disappeared. There was like a, like a two or three people who kept that lineage. And then when concept art came back, 
everyone had to go search out those two three people and train and then they had this like resurgence where like technical technical skills came back mm-hmm. they, al- they almost like totally died off yeah and it is interesting that like that could happen again like we could see like a dip a dip in technical draftsmanship but it seems like for instance um y- a technical draftsman would become more rare and like their painting would sell more you know like yeah. it's there or that's what i'm thinking we is. never foresaw like concept art needing right. technical draftsmanship like there might be something that pops up that we're not even seeing yeah the traditional skills are gonna the value of those are gonna go way up mm-hmm. so don't um don't sleep on that stuff yeah yeah yeah, I do worry a little bit. Um, I, I don't spend as much time online as I used to, but I have creeped a little bit recently. And I, I will say the one big bummer is is seeing the young artists go, like, I don't know what I'm going to do now. Like, what does this mean for me? And I'm like, you know, it. it my worry is, like, the kids that are coming out, like, how they're going to see it because they shouldn't give up because... Well, that's, like, that's why I went to engineering school because, like, someone yeah. literally told me animation is dead. Yeah. And I didn't know there was anything else. So I just was like, I guess I'll go do engineering. That's probably like what y'all are saying is probably even in, an even better reason to get into animation, get into art is because so many people are going to be steered away from it. Yeah. You know, it's like try to try to learn up on that traditional, mm-hmm. you know, and because there's there's going to be a market for it. If it's not right now, it's probably going to be at some point, you know, so don't let it deter you like that should be even more of a reason well like great more people are going to be dropping out of this i would say focus on the writing skills yeah Yeah. focus on the cinematography and filmmaking skills even if um you know in 10 years from now they have some living creature (laughs) ai that's not scraping that helps you Oh, like a little <laughs> weird thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, if I get a robot buddy, I might, I might be a little, <laughs> a little bit kinder to AI. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, you're still gonna need to know how to like create like storytelling cinematics to amplify the storytelling. Like, no matter what. Yeah. Like you're, the human experience will always be needed. Yeah. Because even, I mean, not to get like super philosophical. But like, even if AI did create life, like, which is something that like uh, there have been people talking about, like it, we might have passed the point of no return already on some of this stuff, which is a little bit scary. There's been some interesting, scary stuff about that sort of thing. But even if if that happened, right, and the robots became sentient and they truly were, how they would experience life would be different how than we would because they aren't like carbon based life forms like we are. Yeah. You know, they would be a completely different life form that would experience the world in a different way, which. But then, then there's the argument of like, well, their stories would probably be valid, but valid in a different way because then you have the conversation of like the human experience is going to be different than theirs. Yeah. So we're cooler, anyways. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough because it's like you want to tell young kids like, it's yeah, learn <laughs> learn your draftsmanship. It's not going to affect you, but you also don't want to lie to people. Yeah. You know? I mean, like I always think, like you know, the hierarchy of needs of like pay your bills, things like that, like. I don't think there's anything wrong with having like backup plans, you know, having a skill that you can fall back on that you can make money. And, you, you know, I think being an artist is just if you're if you want to be an artist, you're an artist, right? Like that's there's nothing. No one can take that away from you, um, whether you have a job or not. And, you know, being able to take care of yourself and then do what you love. You know, if you're lucky to work in the industry, that's great. But like, I think that. I don't know. That's one thing I wish people had instilled in me when I was younger. It's like, you still have value, even if you don't, like, do this, you know, for your career. Oh, know? we we do? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, if you, like, decide <laughs> you want to go, like, live on a farm tomorrow, like, you still totally have value. Oh, dang. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, finding... Uh, like, not tying your self-importance to, like, a job. Yeah. But, like, m- I think more just how you move through the world and, mm-hmm. like, your friendships and all that kind of stuff is, it sounds cliche and it's in every movie. Yeah. But it's, like, very true. Yeah. It's unhealthy to 
think that way in terms of like I'm only as good as my job or my career, how successful or how many followers I have on yeah. Instagram or any of that stuff. Yeah. The rat race. So you have a new class coming up. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I'm going to be uh, teaching my storyboarding basics class again, starting on March 21st, uh, going until May 9th. And yeah. Awesome. And what level of student is it for? Um, I would say beginner um, or if you want a review, like a refresher. Um, I, I geared it to people who have probably never boarded before. That's kind of how I designed it. Um, it's kind of what I would say like a drawing class meets a film class. So we'll be first week we'll be going over drawing shorthand, um, the drawing skills um, that you should have for boarding. Um, even if you aren't a strong drawer, though, don't feel intimidated. Like it's meant to be for beginners. And then uh, we'll be going into talking about how to study films so you can learn how to board from those films. That's great. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thanks for stopping by. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This is fun. We'll see y'all next time. Boom. Sweet.